would like to call our meeting to order 601 and do declare that we have a board quorum present. If you will please stand for our invocation and then our pledges of allegiance. Our invocation will be led by Mr. Chris Dunn and then our pledges of allegiance by the A.P. Boydell Elementary School students. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, come to you tonight. Father, just uh, thank you for uh, blessing this community, uh, blessing the <coughs> schools, uh, the kids that we get to serve, the families. Um, uh, Father, we just pray that uh, as we near the end of this year, that uh, Lord, that we'll finish strong and uh, that safety uh, will continue to prevail. And uh, just watch over our, our kids and our employees, our teachers, administrators, and everything. Now, Father, we thank for our guests tonight. Um, and thank for the celebration that we get to recognize great things happening. It's great that you just run and return everybody safe uh, home after we finish here. I just pray that everything that is done tonight will be with your glory. Just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Good evening, Superintendent Matthew, Board President Howard, Board Members, Ms. Sage, welcome back. <coughs> to our staff and to our families and friends here and our guests, thank you so very much for joining us. We have much to celebrate, much to celebrate. Our first will be our Director of Career and Technical Education and Fine Arts, Ms. Amy Pope, to present the first several. Good evening. Like she said, I have a lot, so I'm really excited. So our first one is the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo Industrial Craft Competition. The Industrial Craft Competition, or called ICC, helps to foster the development of industrial craft skills for students who are enrolled in career and technical education programs from over many Gulf Coast area school districts. In this context, students work together to build and execute an industrial skid. Students must comply with daily industrial safety inspections, including the proper use of PPE and daily safety task analysis. Brazoswood team constructed a spec built project that is judged by industry experts. They are required to deliver a brief presentation to the judges, preceded by a detailed inspection of their project. The students also kept a journal of their progress that covered their roles, the project safety plan, an incident log, the project schedule, and any rework that was completed. Brazoswood High School was awarded three of five possible awards. They received the safety award, project execution, and overall project champion. The safety award is based on the ability to build a project without an accident or injury to the participants and by avoiding damage to the equipment or property. Students are evaluated on the proper use of personal protective equipment and related best practices, as well as their ability to modify the work process if and when necessary. Project execution evaluates the various components of the project plan, including scope of work, project goal, quality and technical specifications, resource allocation, project schedule, project estimate, and related organizational considerations. Finally, the overall project champion is awarded based on a well-worked plan that was completed safely and resulted in a final product that matched the customer specifications. We'd like to thank BASF, Zachary Group, and Apache Industrial Services, Inc. for mentoring and supporting this group throughout the process. Without further ado, we'd like to recognize our amazing teachers, students, and mentors. 
our teacher, Mr. Michael Strobel, our mentors, BASF, we have Jeremy Moore and Jonathan Meow. From Zachary is Jake Hughes. From Apache, we have Lisa Webb. Of course, our coordinator that helps with everything, Aaron Ennis. Our team members that are present tonight are Wyatt Kenya.
Brazos Wood and Brazos Sport High School Chapters of Texas Association of Future Educators, or TAFI, attended the TAFI Teach Tomorrow Summit at the Kalahari Resort in Round Rock, Texas, March 2nd, uh, March 2nd through the 4th, 2023. TAFI is a statewide co-curricular career and technical student organization created to allow young men and women an opportunity to explore the teaching profession. Attendees to this three-day conference included members of TAFI, which consisted of approximately 2,800 students interested in becoming future educators. The conference gave these students the opportunity to meet others from around the state with the same interests, gain an understanding of what it takes to be a successful college student, and learn the skills necessary for becoming a success successful educator. TAFI's mission is to encourage students to learn about careers in education and assist them in exploring the teaching profession while promoting character, service, and leadership skills necessary for becoming effective educators. While at the conference, many of the members participated in competitive events. The competitive events are designed to offer future educators exciting, authentic opportunities to measure their creativity, skills, and initiative against high standards and against their peers from across the state. There are 35 competitive events and 22 of those events advanced to nationals. The students who placed in the top 10 in each of the national events have the opportunity to compete as the educators writing that will have the opportunity to compete at the Educators Rising National Conference June 29th through July 2nd in Orlando, Florida. We are proud of our six students who will represent Brazos Florida ISD at nationals. Our TAPI teachers are Mary Ashley Gomez and Karen Pierce. For Brazoswood, we have Olivia Bono and Catherine Odom for Children's Literature, K-3, and they have their book that they wrote, it's amazing. Liana Galvan for Lesson Planning and Delivery Arts, and Paulina Solis and Lydia Perez for Children's Literature Spanish.
Now for our final recognition of the evening, I'd like to introduce our athletic director, Mr. Jay Zeller. Good evening, trustees, Mr. Massey, and community. I don't have as many, but what I have is packs a mighty punch, so we're excited to celebrate this evening. Uh, Brazosport High School sophomore Aubrey Martinez qualified for the 4A state powerlifting meet was held in March. Under the guidance of Coach T.J. Height and Coach Randy Brooks, Aubrey's relentless efforts in the weight room this year earned her the title of the 10th strongest female lifter in the 114-pound weight class. This honor was achieved after Aubrey PR'd on the squat, the deadlift, and in total weight lifted at the state meet. Tonight we celebrate Aubrey's successful power li powerlifting season and look forward to her continued success over the next two years. Thank <laughs> you. 
obviously, well, we will be back in May for more great things on the students and staff. In accordance with BED Local, the uh, board will provide an audience with individuals who have signed up prior to the board meeting. To not, we do not have any uh, requests to uh, comment to the board, so we'll move to our next agenda item. Uh, our, consent, our consent agenda, uh, the next item is our consent agenda. Are there any items to be pulled from the consent agenda this evening? Also allow any public comments for individuals who signed up prior to the meeting to discuss consent agenda items. Do we have any? Do we have any signed up? Any items to be pulled? All right. Hearing none then, do I have a motion to approve uh, the consent agenda as presented? Move by Mr. Dunn. Do I have a second? No second. Second by Scott. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed by nay. All right, that carries. Next item that we have are action items. Public comment will be allowed before a vote is taking, taken on each action item. Our first action item is the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee uh, related action items. Ms. Kelly will share. Thank you. Good evening. Um, our Citizens Bond Oversight Committee was established by the Board of Trustees to ensure that tax dollars are expended as approved by the voters and evaluate any proposed changes and communicate accordingly with the Board of Trustees. Our quarterly meeting was held on March 22nd here at the Administration Building, and there are two action items for Board consideration this evening. <coughs> One is the reallocation of funds for the Bradgesport High School CTE construction contract, and then the second is to accept the resignation and nominations for new members. The Bradgesport High School CTE guaranteed maximum price contract was $3.6 million over the 2019 bond program budget. As presented at the March meeting when recommending approval of the guaranteed maximum price, the district has available funds designated for construction that are available to complete this project. We have investment earnings from the 2019 bond program. We have 2019 bond program contingency funds. And then we have the additional 2014 bond funds that were carried over to the 2019 bond. Administration presented a reallocation of $1,665,487 from the 2019 bond program contingency and to use $2 million from interest earnings. This recommendation was approved by the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee and is now being presented for approval tonight. The second action item was to accept the resignations of Terry and Joda McCullough. They have served for many years and have decided to resign due to health reasons. The other resignation is for Mr. Ed Garcia, who unfortunately lost his battle to cancer. I do have two new member nominations. Uh, Brian Daniels is a Lake Jackson resident um, since 2016. He has four children, three of which attend our Brazosport ISD schools, one's at Brandon, one's at Lake Jackson, and one's at Brazoswood High School. He is a chemical engineer at the SI group in Freeport. And then the second new member for recommendation or nomination was Mr. Eric Aguilar. He's a Clute resident, and he currently serves as a member of the Clute City Council. Um, he ran on a vision of infrastructure and helping local businesses. He is a loan occupation, or excuse me, his occupation is a loan officer, and he is known for his civic participation in the Brazosport Hispanic Chamber, the United Way, and the Emerging Leader Leaders Association. So at this time, administration rec recommends that the Board of Trustees approve the reallocation and the interest allocation to complete the Brazosport High School construction project and to approve the new member nominations and recognition. I will be happy to answer any questions. Questions from the board? From the audience? <coughs> All right, hearing none, do we have a motion on the recommendation from the administration? No, we do. So moved by Mr. Reinhardt, do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Quayar. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed by nay. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next action item we have is our interlocal agreement for track and parking at Student Office. Thank you. Good evening. In accordance with board policy, CB local.
local. It is my pleasure to present the interlocal agreement for the track and parking lot improvements at Stephen F. Austin Elementary. <coughs> Stephen F. Austin Elementary has several areas of need identified as we work to improve the site for the 2023-2024 school year. Some of these necessary improvements included repairs to the asphalt on the surround on, on and surrounding the campus. Once these areas were identified, our Director of Maintenance, Mr. Ken Schulte, met with Brazoria County to discuss the needed improvements and the possibility of an interlocal agreement to complete the work. After viewing the site with Commissioner Dude Payne, the county provided a materials estimate and indicated they would be very happy to pursue an interlocal agreement for the work. Pending Brazosport ISD approval this evening, the interlocal agreement will be slated for approval at the Commissioner Court's meeting on April 25, 2023. The areas slated for improvement at Stephen F. Austin Elementary are the center of the staff parking lot, you can see circled up there, the playground, the entire playground track, and the three entrances to the campus from Stephen F. Austin Road. Under the agreement, <coughs> The county would provide labor and equipment at no charge up to $10,000. The district will group would be responsible for the full material cost and any labor and equipment beyond $10,000. The total estimated cost for the materials is $20,217. As always, Brazos Port ISD is very appreciative of the county and Commissioner Dupain for helping us with our campus needs. Any questions on that slide? It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the proposed interlocal agreement for the track and parking at Stephen F. Austin Elementary. Mr. For the, the three entrances, are we just working on our entrance? Yes. Okay. And that's, so the road to the parking lot is... It, it's good, okay. yes sir. Okay. And the part that you see circled on the parking lot, Alan and I were just discussing, the reason that it's really just that centerpiece, the rest of that is concrete. There's a little more asphalt where you see that back row of cars kind of to the south. I don't know if it's true south, but south on oh, yeah, yeah. as it lays there. Uh, that's asphalt, but it's in really good shape. So anything that's in disrepair, we're taking care of. A little circle used to be grass in there. <laughs> many, many, many years ago. Your covered wagon got through the door. Any other questions from the board? <laughs> Any questions from the audience? All right, hearing none, then do we have a, <clears throat> do we hear a motion on the recommendation from administration? I'll move for approval. All right, and moved by Mr. Schwartner, second. Second. Second by Mr. Reinhardt. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed by nay. All right, that carries. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, next item that we have under uh, our agenda are our reports. Um, public comment will be allowed on each report. Our first report is our bond planning and construction update. Mr. Howard Good evening. In accordance with board policy CB Local, it is my pleasure to present the planning and construction update for the 2019 bond program. As of this month, we're at 73% completed or in progress. These slides were taken last Friday, and this is looking at the front, ed the new front entry to Hopper Field, and uh, it's moving along very well. The uh, almost all of the brickwork is completed. Uh, the paving <coughs> uh, should be in place soon. I thought it was actually in place late Friday, but it did not get put down. And this is the concession stand and restroom additions. Uh, it is on schedule. It's just uh, took a while to get out of the ground, but now it's moving along as well. And then this is just another view uh, from the home side. And over at Hopper Field, the field house is, I'm sorry, it <coughs> slide says Hopper Field. <laughs> that's, that's, that's obviously not Hopper Field. That's uh, the new field house at Bridgeport High School, and it's moving along very well and on schedule. Getting a lot of brick in place, and uh, it uh, uh, looks very similar to the existing campus. It blends in very well. And then this is looking from uh, the uh, other side, and you can see the old field house is now gone, and so uh, 
parking will be in that place, in that same area soon, and then the driveway extension as well. And this is looking uh, from the levee down towards the where the windows are, which is the uh, weight room. And this is in the front entry as you go through the security vestibule, the main corridor area. And this is the reception area and coach's office. And this is the girls' equipment storage room. Some of these rooms start looking a little light. <laughs> and this is the weight room. <coughs> and this is the training room. It's going to be laid out very nicely. And then this is the main corridor looking back towards the front entry with the weight room to the right. And this is the uh, varsity football storage area. And this is the varsity football locker room. And now over at Bryce High School CTE, uh, this is of course our rendering uh, slide and we have started construction. There's a lot of behind the scenes going on, a lot of utility work and all, but uh, so you don't see a lot, but they have, just since this was taken on Friday, they do have the temporary emergency access that the city of Freeport required, uh, which is down at the bottom part of the slide. Uh, that is now in place, and then we'll start working on, uh, they're installing their fences and all at the front of the building, so we can start working. Over at Polk and Griffith, uh, this summer we'll be uh, working on the new stacking lane additions. At Griffith, we uh, I think we stated last <coughs> month that we did traffic studies just to make sure that what we're doing in this project will actually satisfy the, the needs of the traffic. And so uh, I'm glad we did because we ended up having to add a little bit more than what we originally planned to Griffith. And so uh, that's a triple stacking lane that goes all the way through there. And uh, then we've got a small parking addition uh, in the front of that parking lot. Over at Polk, uh, we were pretty much dead on with the uh, with our estimate needs on that, and then the traffic study came in and confirmed that. So um, we uh, it just goes in through the parking lot, comes out. We'll be adding. Um, Canopies for the student pick up and drop off. Uh, you probably can't see over on this screen. It'll be added over to this area. There's already a canopy that comes out from the building, and we'll just be adding to that. I did find out today that the uh, we talked about it in a meeting with the city uh, two weeks ago, um, but I found out it was confirmed today that the uh, one-way traffic will go away once this is completed, which will be before the start of school. So that'll help a lot. So when they exit out of this pick up and drop off, they can either turn right or left. So what's a little squiggly do up there? That's a, uh, a little addition for the buses to turn in there. Oh, okay. The the tools. Tools. Yeah, okay. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Okay. Any questions from the board? I do have a question on the hopper field. Mm -hmm. the, we've got entrances on both sides. What's, what's, what's the purpose of this? Allow more people to get in or bands on one side? And I think it's students and band uh, will go over to the right side okay. and, then, and then the regular okay. attendees would go in. Okay. Right. Not the is it two things? Inside of that ticket area being redone too, I guess? <coughs> the outside. Just the outside. Oh, yeah, we're not touching the inside. The outside gets paint, um, lighting, and uh, we're painting the brick. It's going to blend in with the new arches and as, as well as the field house building behind it. And uh, also get new fascia around the top part. Just out of curiosity, Alex, how much will be done before graduation? Don't say it out loud. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. We would like to say that we will have it completed before we get grad uh, graduation. 
Not the not the concession stand oh, yes, 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 but the yes, front yes, entry. Yes. We we are trying. They are trying very hard, and I'm pushing them very hard. They're skip, They're not c contractually required to have it completed, but they're trying. To. So I mean, we still have a month. You know, as long as the weather stays like it did today, that would, that would be yeah. awesome. So I, I have high hopes that it will be where we could at least the wrought iron might not be in and that sort of thing, but it may be in where we can actually. Yeah, it'll be pretty good. Yeah. yeah. It'll all work. I'm just curious. Yeah. I'm um, here for bathroom. <laughs> many people have asked me because on the, uh, the what is it, L.D. Bryant on the Hopper Field, I mean on the Fieldhouse yeah. building, some of the letters are missing. And uh, Jerala Construction is providing new letters for us. They probably will not, and they'll be the nice brushed aluminum letters, the ones that are out there now are just flat and they're white. And probably can't have those in in time. We're trying, but probably won't have them in in time by graduation, but uh, we're working with maintenance on maybe putting something temporary out there just so they're not missing. If, if anything, we may just take them down. That'd be the best, that'd be the best thing right there. Any other comments from the board? Get the fine art students to go paint something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Comments from the audience? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next report we have is the 2024 budget planning update. Ms. Kelly. I wish there were more people here to hear you. Yes. Um, in alignment with the district goal that Brad and Port ISD will exercise this full responsibility to ensure the financial strength and secure the resources to equip and maintain quality facilities and educational programming. Tonight is my pleasure to provide an update on the current 2023 budget along with an update on the 2024 budget development process. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> uh, we started the process of developing the 24 budget in January. We have completed campus staffing meetings and we're still in the process of meeting with department leaders. While providing compensation increases uh, remains a budgetary priority, we will not present compensation tonight for approval as there are several legislative bills pending that will impact compensation. So we will present it as soon as reasonably possible. Um, we still have several months of work ahead of us with the budget being prepared by August 7th and then adopted um, on August 21st. Um, the Brazoria County Appraisal District published property value appraisals last week, which generated some questions yeah. and some concerns and maybe some misinformation. So I just want to speak briefly um, to how that process works when it comes to setting the Brad Support ISD tax rate. Um, Brazoria County Appraisal District is a completely separate um, entity from Brad Support ISD and is a local <coughs> subdivision, an independent local subdivision of the state of Texas. The Texas legislature sets the laws on the state uh, property tax system and governs how the central appraisal districts operate. They are responsible for setting appraisals. The Texas comptroller conducts an annual property value study to ensure that the appraisal district is, is appraising values in alignment with the tax code. For the past two years, the comptroller study found that the Brazoria County appraisal district values are too low and not at market value. Brazos Port ISD is not directly or indirectly in control of the market and or the appraised value. Brazos Port ISD does, however, set the total tax rate, which is comprised of two separate tax rates. The maintenance and operation tax rate, which is currently 91.77 cents per $100 of assessed value, which is what we use to fund our general operating and our annual cost. The interest and sinking rate, which is 21.53 cents per $100 of assessed value, is used to repay debt associated with bond projects. Our annual general fund budget, the, with the current provisions of the school finance formula, sets a target revenue based on the number of students that we serve and average daily attendance, plus several special program allotments. We have two primary sources of revenue. We have local m and property taxes that we collect and then state funding. For the current year, BISD will collect about $94.8 million in m and taxes. The state will pay about $8.4 million. The system, the current system is structured that 
and that when the state's budget is appropriated, they, they assume that the property taxes will increase each year. However, the district doesn't get to retain those dollars. So as we collect more locally in taxes, the, the graph doesn't work, but basically the red dollar signs go up and the amount that the state funds in green falls off. So as our local property taxes go up, the state funds us less and less. And so we don't get to keep all of those dollars. What we do control at this point and adopt is the tax rate. So House Bill 3 from the 86th legislative session did allow us to compress the local tax rate as the property values increases. As such, we have been able to reduce the total tax rate by over 12 cents and we will continue to reduce the tax rate as we are allowed to do so under state law. And so this is just a graph on the right-hand side of the tax rate comparison. Um, our tax rate is in red, and, it, and that's how it compares to um, surrounding districts in our area. So for our area, we have the third lowest tax rate. And then the graph on the left shows the just over 12 cent reduction that we've made since the passage of House Bill 3 um, over the past five years. So our current total adopted tax rate is $1.13 and 0 .3 cents and then the prior year rate was $1.1787. So we have reduced the tax rate as the values have gone up. <coughs> Local taxpayers are paying more and more each year and the funding formula amounts um, that are used to calculate the target revenue that for districts across the state have not been increased for over four years. Those extra local tax dollars are being recaptured by the state. The legislature actually budgets for this increase to local property taxes as part of their budget, and then the state retains recapture as part of their general fund. For the current year, it is expected to be over $3 billion. Um, to put that in perspective, the state lottery, which was intended to support public education, only brings in about $1.6 billion. So recapture has become a major source of revenue for the state of Texas. Since the inception of recapture in 1999, Brazos Cordiasi has paid over $200 million back to the state. House Bill 3 from the legislative, from the 86th legislative session um, has allowed us to compress the tax rate by 12.3 cents and has made a significant impact on the amount that we are actually having to send back. Um, in 2019, we sent back over $33 million and now this year, last year we sent back over two, and this year our budget is five. Actual is going to come in a little over two. And so um, House Bill 3 did make a significant um, step in the right direction in terms of allowing districts to compress their local tax rate um, and reduce recapture. But the current projections are far exceeding what the state anticipated um, it to grow in. So still a major source of revenue and something that is continuing to be looked at. The 2023 budget was adopted with a $10.4 million deficit. Revised projections of $11 million deficit was presented in January. I have rerun two new projections based on some additional adjustments to the average daily attendance and some other funding, weighted funding groups and the updated available school fund per capita rate. And so you'll notice that there's two new columns um, added at the end. And as previously mentioned, the Brazoria County Appraisal <laughs> District local appraised values did not meet the state property value study. And so we obviously have appealed that, but this has happened for the second consecutive year in a row, and at this point we've not received um, the decision from the state. And so what ultimately will happen is that if they do not approve our appeal, the state will use the state assigned value in our formula, meaning we will pay recapture on revenue that we did not collect. And so um, this could have an impact of $3.2 million um, that was not accounted for in our budget. Um, so the revised deficit is now between nine and a half and $12.9 million, depending on what the state does with the property value appeal. And then this slide has the revised revenue projections um, for next year on out through 26-27. And so um, I did update this to include the 26-27 um, school year. Um, these are based on current law and include a tax rate compression for next year of six cents. Um, this is just an estimate and is likely to be different based on pending legislation around additional property tax relief. 
um, I have provided this complete handout of both current year projections and next year's projections at your board station. So let's talk about some legislation. House Bill 1 currently includes $17.3 billion for property tax reduction, $2.4 billion for an increase to the golden penny portion of our Tier 2 funding, and $5 billion for other school finance improvements. While there is a good number of bills moving that could draw on these funds, we do anticipate that House Bill 100 will contain many of the formula funding provisions that are important to the House in this session. House Bill 100, as it stands today, includes an increase to the basic allotment of $90 for next year and an additional $50 a year in 2025. The basic allotment is currently $6,160, so a $90 increase is under a 2% increase. While districts in the state in the state have seen inflationary indexes well over 14% during this same time. So not what we were hoping for, but it's certainly a, a step in the right direction. Um, this additional increase in the basic allotment would generate just under a million dollars per fiscal year 24, and then the additional $50 would generate uh, $519,000 uh, for the following year. Um, still not tied to ADA, um, it, still tied to ADA and not changing to enrollment-based funding, however, so it's not quite what we wanted. Um, and then House Bill 100 also has um, allowed districts to ask, access six golden pennies. Um, right now we have access to five and we are using all five of those. Um, one additional penny would generate about $950,000 in additional funding to the district. Um, this bill also includes a new funding allotment for special education evaluation at $500 each and having conducted over 807 evaluations this year, we could potentially generate over $400,000. Although keeping the basic allotment based on ADA, House Bill 100 would fund several of the program allotments based on ADA and under an enrollment based funding. And this would generate roughly $300,000 in additional funding. And then some new allotments for fine arts and an advanced math pathway would also generate new funding at just under 200,000. And then an adjustment to the transportation per mile allotment would generate another $200,000. And then lastly, this bill increases the minimum salary schedule. While we pay teachers well above that current minimum schedule and even the proposed schedule, um, this will generate a cost savings that is yet to be calculated as TRS the state will pick up a larger portion of the retirement contribution based on the new minimum schedule. Oops, I'm not done yet, sorry. Um, we're also watching closely House Bill 5, which is the new economic development bill that would revamp the expired provisions of Tax Code 313. This bill, as it stands, would keep the decision to enter into an agreement for a value limitation with the local Board of Trustees and um, restructures the tax savings sharing bracket slightly, but it does allow districts to negotiate and retain those payments outside of the recapture system. And then Senate Bill 11 is a safety allotment bill, and while it does move from an ADA to a per campus allotment, it fails to adequately fund mandates that it would put in place to require an officer on each campus. And then House Bill 2 has some additional tax rate compression that could allow districts to reduce the MNO tax rate by 15 cents, and then it would also lower the 10% homestead cap down to 5%. A notable comment from um, Lieutenant Governor was made saying that fi the 5% cap and the math do not add up. So I'm not really sure where this bill is going to go, um, but it's something that we're watching is um, it does allow us to compress the tax rate further, which would increase the state share of funding for public education. And then I'll also add that lowering the cap um, could impact districts' INS tax rates, um, and then it does not benefit those over 65. And then House Bill 187 would eliminate May bond elections, and Senate Bill 2088 provides an early payment credit for districts that would still be subject to recapture, 10%. And then these proposed bills could generate an additional three to three and a half million dollars in new revenue for Brassport ISD. We did receive some estimates from Representative Bazoo's office that showed about $3.4 million. I tried to recreate those 
you know, using my own estimates, and I came to about three million dollars. Um, what I don't have is those TRS savings, and so not really sure, but three to three and a half million dollars is probably pretty accurate. Um, all of these bills are still being debated between the House and the Senate, so nothing is final. And so my revenue projections that I've presented are still based on current law. And then the next few slides are not new, and they contain the areas previously identified and discussed as possible reductions. I have added a column with today's date to indicate the reductions that we have made decisions to move forward with. We're still evaluating opportunities to reduce spending. So far, we have identified and considered $8.5 million of reductions and have taken just $2.3 million so far. So I'll go quickly through these. Again, nothing new. The administrative and central office reductions are $684,000. Campus staffing adjustments at a million. Supplemental extra duty pay at three twenty-five. dollars Campus and department discretionary allocations, 107. And so kind of where does that leave us right now based on revenue projections and the reductions um, that we have taken? Um, net revenue decrease based on current law is just under a million dollars. Um, we have an adopted deficit in the current year of 10.4 million. We've got total reductions of 2.3 million. So right now we would be looking at an $11.7 million deficit with $3.4 million in contingencies, and so we would end up with an $8.4 million um, actual deficit. Um, this is before any compensation increases that we will bring to you. And then we do currently have $55.7 million in undesignated fund balance, um, and we're projected to close this year at a $9.5 million deficit, assuming the state approves our appeal. And then we would have $8.3 million in excess fund balance after next year and on paper deficit of 11.7 at this point. So, As we move through the budget development process, we will continue <coughs> to evaluate opportunities to reduce spending. We are committed to making reductions from all levels and areas of spending that protect the learning opportunities for students and reduce the areas that have minimal impact to student achievement. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. So our 55 million surplus that we have is going to be reduced by potentially 11 million. No. So, nine million. so the 55 that we have today will be reduced by the current year deficit, which right now is nine and a half million dollars. Um, so that will leave us the 46 million available. Optimum is 37. So that's about eight. $8.6 million after we close this current year, and that's what's in the general fund undesignated. So there's some additional assignments um, down below um, that are also general fund or could be used by the general fund. And so <coughs> right now undesignated is about 8.4. And so our projected for the year coming are just going to keep drawing upon that undesignated fund balance. Yes, sir. By an ever-growing Should we know about the appeal? I'm hoping by the end of the month. Good. That's quite a chunk. That's but they approved the appeal last year, but it was the first year, so I'm not really sure like being the second consecutive year. Um, but okay. is there someone that we need to call to help that through, or not? Um, not that I'm aware of. It's a completely different. Who's Employees, stuff like that. 
did assume that we're taking a real tight look at adding employees or replacing some and, and that type of thing. I'm not sure it adds up to a lot of money, but it yeah. will eventually get there. So, I mean, this is a tight, tight, tight budget from that standpoint as far as, you know, do we, do we look at a, you know, Scott and I mentioned this, you know, we talked about a little, several weeks ago about, do we just have a straight across the board cut? Is that feasible? I mean, that's, that's equal, equally sharing the, the hardship, but uh, I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. But, but you know, this, this is uh, uh, a time that we take a look at uh, uh, even the smallest, because it's going to add up. And, and like Mason was saying, it's going to roll into the next several years. The problem with the straight across, I agree, I think it's <coughs> Potential solution the problem is that that number is not that big when you're talking about expenses and you pull out labor, right? Right. Um, so it's not like we're spending 20 million on paper, yeah. um, you know, and so in books. So those numbers, in reality, aren't that big when you do a 10 percent. Now 10 percent helps, but I'm not saying that shouldn't be on the plan, but it's a good first start, but it's not a cure-all for us because labor is still our 87% driver. Yeah, I can, I can assure you, Mr. Atkins, we have taken a tight look at it and continue <laughs> to be tight about it. Uh, so we, um, uh, I agree, it's, it's, people are, are going to make the difference in the budget. Uh, but we do have a commitment to reduce the attrition also, so we don't want to do an across the board uh, reduction of people, but we, we do evaluate each position as they come open. So am I reading this right too, that the contingency potential is to be lowered? That's an option. Okay. So the budget 3.4 million, which is part of the $11 million um, that we would be adopting on paper as a deficit. So if I reduced that amount that I factored in, it would reduce the adopted deficit. But then, and we talked about that in January, maybe the um, workshop that we had in February. And so, so do we have a, say like a graph of our last five years of what our contingency was in the budget and what we actually used to that that we could compare? I don't, I don't have a chart, but I can put one together. But, you know, that, that's a good way of saying, okay, you know, I, I feel a more comfortable cutting that. I think I think history in my people's mind says that we haven't we've had some good savings we have on the contingency. Yeah. So, but it'd be good to see that. I'm week. not sure that there's been a district that's not been here that we've ever used all of it. Uh -huh. so there was one year we had a late uh about the year that we had the uh, hailstorm. I think we used some cash that time out of the contingency just to cover until the insurance got us back like eight months later or two months later, whatever. I think there, I, I, um, I don't know if y'all are on Twitter or not, but um, you know, Spring Branch ISD has um, been very public about the shortfalls of uh, basic allotment and what it means to them and, and how that's affected them from a revenue standpoint and all that. And they have gotten the ear uh, of our center, Ms. Huffman, and, and Betancourt, who may be a more important one to give an ear of. Um, in this fight, and so uh, they've had multiple meetings over the last uh, couple of days to discuss. They're in a much, they're in a similar situation to us in that they are um, a property rich district with uh, greater than 60% eco D and similar. I think they have a similar uh, district to us. They're bigger, but similar um, from that standpoint. So they have, they're paying 87 million in recapture have about a $50 million shortfall next year. So um, there, there's a lot of discussions in and around that. And, uh, they asked for a $1,000 basic allotment increase. And I don't know if that was well received from anybody in the Senate. <laughs> but, um, but, but it's, but it's they, they have the map around it, right? And, um, you know, they have a, a very conservative board, I guess is a better way to say that. And they're fighting through some of the budget issues. So we'll see if that
yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, based on a thousand dollars, you know, uh, last Tuesday in Austin, and these guys were happy. They were very proud of this ninety dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they were extolling, yeah. you know, how much that's going to help. Which is why I highlighted the percentage increase it is compared yeah. to the inflation that we always see. Yeah, 100%. And, and, and they, they, they've been putting out, it's been really good uh, reading, but they've been putting out a lot of good information from a budget standpoint on inflation and um, some of their budget issues that they're facing too from that perspective. So I know for sure they've gotten the ear of uh, some pretty powerful senators um, that are influential <coughs> from that standpoint. So it'll be a matter of. Uh, Ms. Huffman's office still hasn't called me back just in case she's watching. May have, <laughs> may have she says she watches the spring branch, but she hasn't called me back yet, so we'll see if she calls me back. But um, that's what you're watching, Ms. Huffman. They should have a little more influence, too. They should have a little more influence. They do have a lot of influence. Um, that's a, that's a um, um, conservative stronghold uh, for uh, elected officials, and so uh, it's important from a Houston perspective. And so it's a uh, and they're a very organized politically uh, community, also. Um, and so uh, it's, it's uh, been an interesting uh, follow up for sure. But to, to Jerry's point, I mean, if they're excited about $90 and their spring branch is asked for 1000 because I read all the stuff that yep. you said, I mean, <clears throat> my personal feeling is that they just keep. Austin just continues to drop breadcrumbs and says we're we're providing, yeah. we're providing for y'all. Y'all are fine when we know that uh, just from inflation we're we're falling behind every year. So yeah. I mean we're going to have to make. I mean yes we have a tight budget this year, but in two years next year it's going to be even tighter, and the following year it's going to be even tighter. So so all of the. Especially when we're sending for capture money. Yeah, they're, they're, all they have to do is not send for capture money and, and, and they're, they're made whole. They're back? Yes. Yeah. You know, and then you hear things about them sending for capture money and it's not going to school districts and all that. So <coughs> it's being used Sounds generally like to help fund the budget. Sounds like the grumblings of a revolution. <laughs> they've adopted uh, similar language. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but, right. but, but we're, we're to the point now from a from a capture standpoint that you know some things like that are going to happen. Okay. Any other comments on the board? Thank you. Thank you. Keep calling them. Yeah. Next item that we have under our reports is the 22-23 district improvement plan third quarter review. This should be a little milder report than the last one. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Good evening. Alignment with board policy of each and each district goal. It's my pleasure to deliver the report on the third quarter progress made on the 2022-2023 district improvement plan. You have a copy of the third quarter formative review in your board book. <coughs> The District Improvement Plan required under Chapter 11 of the Texas Education Code is a comprehensive plan to improve the district in each of the five areas covered by our district goals. The 2022-23 plan has a total of 13 performance objectives and 86 strategies to support the district's five goals. The board adopted House Bill 3 goals for early childhood literacy and numeracy, along with college career and military readiness, are included in the plan as performance objectives under goals. 
district improvement plan progress is measured one of five ways. Discontinued, meaning that the strategy has been discontinued for this year. No progress, meaning no progress has been made toward the strategy outcome. Some progress, meaning that from 5% to 49% of progress toward the strategy outcome has been made. Considerable progress, meaning that from 50 to 95% progress has been made and accomplished, meaning the strategy outcome was met. Progress for the third quarter was 52% accomplished, 43% <coughs> considerable progress made, 4% some progress made, 0% no progress made, and 1% discontinued. Of the 22 strategies that support the five performance objectives under District Goal 1, 14 were rated as accomplished. Considerable progress was made on seven of them, and one was discontinued. During the third review period, principals and central office staff continued to actively monitor the implementation of Tier 1 instructional priorities in reading and math classrooms. With state testing looming on the horizon, interventions and tutorials were fully underway at campus. Additionally, to support test preparation, campuses were provided with disaggregated mock star reports that were aligned to the TEA newly released scoring guidance. Work also continued during the third quarter to on aligning industry-based certifications with CETE programs of study to ensure that BISD students will continue to earn credit for having achieved certifications when TEA begins implementing the new CCMR requirements next fall. There are 22 strategies that support the two performance objectives under District Goal 2. During the third quarter, 11 were rated as accomplished, and considerable progress was made on the remaining 11. 95% of designated staff and students were trained on threat assessment reporting and protocols during the end, about through the end of March. <coughs> also during the third quarter, counselors were trained in how to identify and assist victims of human trafficking, and then took that training back to their campuses share with staff. By March 1st, most schools had completed the vaping prevention lessons and documentation required in the improvement plan. And during the third quarter, the DAEP staff continued to support students moving to and from the <coughs> DAEP by writing transition plans for each. Recidivism rates will be evaluated as part of the campus's comp comprehensive needs assessment to help evaluate the effectiveness of those plans. By the end of March, all elementary campuses receive training on implementing Quaver Ready and Rhythm, which are character education programs, and they are implementing those programs. Secondary campuses continue to implement Capturing Kids' Hearts. <coughs> there are 10 strategies that support the two performance objectives under Goal 3. During the second quarter, seven were rated as accomplished, considerable progress was made on two of them, and some progress was made on one of them. As mentioned in February, volunteers began to randomly visit and make phone calls to campuses to audit their customer service as a follow-up to the training that was provided to all frontline staff in October. Excuse me. Each visit and call is being logged, and the volunteers answer a series of questions related to the visit. Responses to those questions <coughs> will be used as part of the comprehensive needs assessment process this month to evaluate the effectiveness of the customer service training and to help identify areas where additional training is needed. To date, 29 visits and 16 phone calls have been made. Results from the campus visits were positive, while phone calls showed improvement over last quarter. Random mystery calls and visits will wrap up this week and be evaluated. <coughs> This week is National Volunteer Appreciation Week, and a promotional video will be posted and promoted on all district social media platforms, highlighting opportunities to volunteer at BISD. In May, volunteers will participate in a thought exchange about the volunteer program that will be used to guide planning for next year. And then Campus Volunteers of the Year will be highlighted this week as well. District Goal 4 is really a two-part goal. The first states that Brazosport ISD will exercise fiscal responsibility to ensure financial strength. And the second part is that the district will provide resources to equip and maintain quality facilities and educational programming. There are 19 strategies under the district <coughs> objectives for Goal 4. Ten were rated as accomplished. Considerable progress was made on seven of them, and 
some progress was made on two. The District Command Center is 90% complete. Technology received updated lead times on the AV controller and equipment is expected to be received sometime in June. The Siemens server upgrade is complete and training is in progress for the new user interface. As I reported to you in February, Quick Alert, the district's mass notification system was launched. As part of the next phase of implementation of that system, campuses are running tests to make sure the system is working properly. In the area of federal programs, supplemental funds were used by campuses to conduct parent and family engagement activities and allocated to campuses for tutoring to help students to continue closing learning gaps. The foundation continued its outstanding work during the third quarter by awarding grants for great ideas and by recognizing the Dow Chemical Company for their generous support and contributions to our CTE programs and giving campaign. During the third quarter, our supplementary funded gifted and talented program began servicing newly identified kindergarten students and they began contacting the second grade students who qualified <coughs> to start in the GT Academy next year. There are 13 strategies that support the three performance objectives under District Goal 5. Two were rated as accomplished and considerable progress was made on 11 of them. In late March, the district and campuses began recognizing outstanding leaders, teachers, and support staff. BISD is blessed to have an excellent team of educators. Making decisions on who to recognize was challenging. We look forward to a night of celebration, celebrating their contributions and accomplishments in May. The Registered Apprenticeship Program Apprentices received additional support and training in March and they continue to do an outstanding job at their assigned campuses. And finally, in February, teachers received ongoing professional development and research-based methods to implement Tier 1 instructional priorities. This concludes the third quarter progress report on the district improvement plan. Since this is a report, board action is not required. I'll return in July with the summative evaluation of the plan. At this time, I'm happy to answer any clarifying questions you or the audience may have. Board? Any questions for the board? Audience? All right, thank you, Mr. Redden. Thank you. <coughs> Next item we have under reports is the student outcomes update the practice card. Brian Cole. Good evening. In accordance with board policy, EH Local, and the district goal Brad support asks you will provide a rigorous and relevant learning experience to ensure that every student will be future ready, it's my pleasure to present a report on the spring practice <coughs> star. As we begin looking at our results, I want to start by explaining the purpose of practice star. A practice star provides a snapshot of learning for the entire scope of the curriculum within a particular subject. It allows campuses data needed to adjust instruction prior to the STAR for both individuals and groups of students. It allows campuses to rehearse the complexity of administering the STAR exam as well as figuring out small groups, accommodations, and the campus's processes and procedures. This year, STAR has been remade. The test includes new item types for a quarter of the assessment. There is writing on all of the reading language arts assessments. The STAR is earlier this year than in past years. It will actually be another 10 days earlier next year. Um, we will not receive results on student performance levels until August in most cases. And the passing standards for approaches, meets, and masters are changing. With all these new changes, the commissioner has indicated that it is worthy of a new name. However, we're keeping the same name, STAR, for now. <laughs> so, let's take a closer look at the guidance that we do have from the state about the changes in the passing rates. The left <laughs> image shows the different cut scores for the passing in rate in third grade reading language arts last year. The state requires students to achieve 50% to reach the minimum passing score. You'll also see that it labels the approaches, meets, and masters on the chart. The right image shows the current guidance for third grade reading language arts. All that is shared is likely passing, or excuse me, likely not passing in orange, the zone of uncertainty in yellow, and likely passing in green. So students could pass with a score between 21% and 38% based on the zone of uncertainty. There is no 
guidance for the meets and masters performance levels. Can, can we just stop right there? <laughs> <laughs> The ridiculousness of this is, it's not even laughable at this point. It's, we're, we're, this is at this point, this is absurdity at its highest extent. The zone of uncertainty is an official term from our TEA. I mean, that's just. On the test that we judge, yeah. the entire test okay. required. That they're already predicting at 21% passing, right? Did I get that right? 21 to 38%. Yeah. That's a low zone. Yeah. Depending on if that, the zone of uncertainty changes. We we don't know how big the zone of uncertainty could be. It's uncertain by definition. <laughs> I'm ready to not take the star test as a district if anybody else is ready. <laughs> I, I've hey. been saying that I've for several years. Yes. The zone of uncertainty whether students will show up. So we'll take a deeper dive now into reading language arts and zone of uncertainty. The slide shows the 2022 minimum passing score in purple column for each grade level, followed in um, red and mustard yellow with the zone of uncertainty range. For example, the last row shows English 2. The minimum passing score in 2022 was 56%. For the current school year, students might pass with a score of 33% on the low end of the zone of uncertainty, which is a 23-point drop in pa the passing score. Uh, and on the high end of the zone of uncertainty, a student could pass with 52%, which is a four-point drop compared to last year. So due to the uncertainty of future cut scores, we adapted our practice star to mirror the state's star, but maintained prior cut scores for passing for approaches, meets, and masters. So as you see the scores on coming slides, we would expect for them to show fairly significant declines compared to prior years because we kept the cut scores at the same level. However, we do expect to see much stronger scores on the final star exam this spring. <coughs> we'll start with reading language arts. Once again, keep in mind that these results are based on prior year cut scores, which in most cases are substantially dropping. Let me take a minute to describe how the table set up. There are three different performance levels for the STAR test. The passing threshold is referred to as the approaches. It's in purple. Then the state of Texas has established two additional performance levels. These are meets in blue and masters in orange. Outlined in red on this slide, you'll see that I have provided the 2021 practice STAR results, the 2022 practice STAR results, the current year practice STAR results, as well as the difference column that represents the change between this year and last year. You can see that we saw a decline as expected due to maintaining prior passing standards. The grades where we saw the smallest drops were in grade levels where there has previously been a written component. Those are fourth, seventh grade along with English one and English two. The differences that we are noting in RLA scores are contributed to the addition of the writing tasks to short constructed responses, as well as an extended constructed response or essay, as well as the new item types. The scoring standards and expectations from the state have changed, as shared, over multiple grade levels. In fourth and seventh and high school, they show the smallest difference between the tests because writing on that exam, exam is not necessarily new for them. Third grade showed the largest difference to the addition of writing, new item types, and paired passages. Our third grade students, in many cases, are still working on some key components of literacy. Rubric analysis and calibration has supported teachers and campuses to focus on low-performing standards. Using information gained, teachers continue to support students with organization and development of ideas, <laughs> as well as conventions and constructed response item types that were scored low on practice, practice star. Since our board goal is focused or for student outcomes or should around the third grade students in math and reading, we'll take a deeper dive to the campus level into this data However, campus level data for all star tested subjects was available and shared in the board report last Friday. You can see that as a district, our overall performance at the meets level is substantially lower than in previous years. However, once again, the cut scores are changing and we have no guidance on what um, the pass rate will be for masters. We do see that students at Brandon performed higher than other campuses by seven points, while TW Aug was our lowest scoring campus. These relative results are fairly consistent with our previous curriculum-based assessments. We'll take a closer look at math now and also zoom in on third grade before we expand further. 
broader. You'll see the same information here about previous passing scores in the zone of uncertainty for this year. On the high end, the passing thresholds are relatively unchanged or increasing. On the low end, they are dropping to 10 or over 25 points. Once again, no guidance for meets and masters. We did choose to keep the same cut scores for our practice star test while amending the star, the practice star <coughs> to mirror the actual star. So as we continue to look at third grade, as an area for our student outcome goals, you'll see that even with unchanged cut scores, we saw an improvement in meets performance. This is nearly 15 points higher. Our 40% score is nearly 15 points higher than the 25% of the 2022 practice star. Um, students at Polk showed the highest performance, while Austin was at the low end. Zooming back out, we'll take a broader look at the math data. We've already transitioned into data for math, but now we can take a look at our elementaries across multiple grade levels. We currently, currently see encouraging results at the elementary grade levels with increases despite potentially lower cut scores. Seventh grade math is certainly an area of concern and has been on our radar for this school year. Campus <coughs> principals, content coordinators, and specialists are actively working with our seventh grade math team. The eighth grade and algebra one scores remain relatively unchanged and show signs of promise knowing that cut scores are likely to change. So in math, our youngest students showed an increase from 2022 to 2023 which really shows that some of the learning gaps are closing. Math was one of the areas that had the largest and most sticky or persistent learning gaps from COVID, and we're beginning to see those uh, close. We're also seeing an increase in uh, mastery of the TEAC, the middle and intermediate. Students continue to show the impact of those learning gaps. Those are students that mainly were in elementary during that time with some of the fundamentals of numeracy, so we're still working to close some of those gaps at the middle and intermediate level. Secondary schools showed a slight decrease from 2022 to 2023. However, we, we would anticipate that we are maintaining progress and closing learning gaps due to COVID, um, especially when we consider potentially changing cut scores. So the science and social studies, what's <coughs> passing now? Let's take a look at science. Once again, you'll see the same information here about previous passing scores in the zone of uncertainty this year. On the high end for science, passing thresholds are relatively unchanged, but decreasing. On the low end, they are dropping over 20 points. Um, once again, no guidance for meets and, and masters. And social studies, on the high end, the thresholds are relatively unchanged, with one increasing and one decreasing. And on the low end, they're dropping nearly 20 points. <coughs> once again, we kept uh, we amended the star test to mirror the actual, or practice to mirror the actual, but kept our cut scores unchanged. So, as we look at the table for science, we see fifth and eighth grade show small declines, which would be a, would be anticipated if cut scores are dropping. The decline in biology, though, does appear to be higher than anticipated. So, we have teams working with our biology teachers, with campus content specialists. Performance levels in social studies have remained <laughs> relatively stable given the new question types and relatively unchanged cut scores for us, although we do anticipate a mixed bag with social studies cut scores potentially on the high end. Our scores for science and social studies have been impacted by the inclusion of new question types, both mock and star tests being moved up earlier in the year, but we are working with our campus teams and campus content specialists, and we are working through review for STAR as well. Let me talk a little bit about next steps. After we administer the STAR, the practice STAR, and get STAR results each year, we do take time to look at the scope and sequence for each of our courses. Now, while we will not have performance data, approaches meets and masters until August, we will get raw scores earlier in the year. That will allow us to work with teacher teams to determine if we need to make any tweaks and changes on how much time we spend on something or the order in which we cover something. It's also very apparent that we need to continue to focus on writing across all grade levels, and this means <coughs> placing additional emphasis on professional learning as it relates to writing, as well as ensuring we continue to monitor writing uh, through measures that take place on our assessment calendar throughout the school year. We must continue with our plan to ensure that all of our elementary teachers and administrators receive training on the science of teaching reading. This requires professional development and equipping our teachers with, and leaders with great skills and knowledge to improve practice across the district. 
We'll continue to monitor closely how students in the classroom are performing and adjust and provide support and targeted areas while celebrating the success that we have seen with many of our students and in many classrooms in the district. And of course, we will definitely reassess where we are after we receive Special Star results in August. We look forward to being able to see how our students are performing compared to students across the state. At this time, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. What bothers me the most is these kids that don't pass Star. We won't know until the end of the summer. They won't have the opportunity to retake it during the summer to stay with their cohort, perhaps. Um, another thing. I hope I'm right. Haven't been around high school kids for a long time. I think I'm hoping that a little bit of apathy set in on the practice, and they didn't take it too uh, seriously, as seriously as they should. Um, but having gone through every <laughs> testing program that the state's thrown out. absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, and we're, we're letting our kids down. And, and that, that really saddens me after retiring from the classroom.
you know, three quarters of a year to cover it in, yeah, that's going to be difficult to cover everything you're supposed to cover within that time frame. I would like to point out mainly to Rebecca that we're not going to accept a loan of uncertainty <laughs> for the budget. <laughs> that's another thing. But anyway, it could be a good try. Um, you know, your presentation here only has a third grade, but the fourth grade was included in the yes. Friday just the, the fourth grade seems to be okay. Yes, sir. From that standpoint. So, yes. you know, I, it, does that mean there's hope for this, these scores now in the third grade for next year? There, yes, there's abso absolutely hope. I think the more we get used to what the new format looks like, um, this was our first time writing an assessment to mirror what the future star will look like, right? So we will also look at did our practice effectively mirror what the actual star shows when we know what the real cut scores are, right? And we'll be able to compare that to previous year's practice stars to know, okay, this was a great practice star if we had the real cut scores or, you know, we need to look at different practice stars. Uh, amending what we're doing as we move forward as well. But yes, that, there is there is most certainly hope. Um, our All of our educators and students learned a lot from this practice star. Many of them had been trying new item types before, but I think once they saw, you know, how put, put you know, 30, 50 questions on a test, depending on, on where it is, and add writing to it, like, that's a lot. It, it is, it's, it's not just about can you answer a question correctly, it's can you endure um, and answer questions correctly. So with the keyboarding, it's going to be a, such that our uh, kindergarten and first grade, even even though you can read what they write without all the proper spelling, it's going to be counted wrong. Mm -hmm. so that's it could be, just, it yeah. could be a missing a period. Yeah, exactly. Another I, still, I still don't put periods in a lot of stuff. So anyway, um, so uh, reading the cabinets, come back to that. Are we, are, is our percentage going up? Yeah, uh, we're almost a uh, percentage of those who have completed. completed. Yes, so. Even with is, the new teachers coming in for this we year? We have. We've, uh, this is our third year, so TEA requires three years. Um, and we will be extending to any teachers that didn't, weren't able to go through this year for whatever reason. If they had to be out for an extended amount of time. So they will, we'll capture them starting in June, um, in addition to our pre-K and our fourth grade teachers. So it, it's still, it, nothing's changed on the uh, class, so to speak? Nothing's changed. Um, on our end, CEA is going to be requiring that we, a new model is used in the future, which is... Um, Probably well thought of. And more expensive. <laughs> it's more expensive, and it requires teachers to be out of the class uh, for 14 days. So we're trying to start capture all of these teachers in June, so we can use our own model with our own people. So uh, we hope to, we hope that this will be our last year that we'll have to complete. But we'll have 100 percent of our teachers completed. Who needs the legislature whenever to discredit public education when you have this teacher? Texas Education Agency that does it for them. What makes it wonder then? Yeah, I mean that's a big conspiracy. Uh, this is reminding of I shared with Brian and, and Dan I talked about this. The guy from Katie that gave all this data mm -hmm. on scores and stuff, mainly for bilingual and ESL. And he's he's not so far out in the left field anymore. He's not as cookie as he, as he was. So yeah. okay. You know what's even it, it, the puts more burden on teachers if you have all this testing earlier in them. You've got another month and a half of school. The teachers have to, to com develop something completely um, new yeah. to, uh, you know, <laughs> 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 hey, this, I can't remember, Mr. Jones, does any of this have to do with the teacher incentive allotment from a star? The star's not part of that, right? In any no, way? No, sir, because okay. Uh, okay. we didn't even determine it was a really valid, reliable measure of students. Okay, I just want to make sure. <laughs> you were just in that zone, weren't you? Yeah. You were in that zone. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure that it's not a, that this isn't going to affect any of that. No, we avoided that intentionally. So, I mean, I mean, 
and districts are having the same conversation. Oh. Everyone. Think about, yeah. it. Think about it. I'm serious. Think about no, it. Every school district in the state have to go through this. Um, I strong opinions. And Chris signed up for one, one night a month. guy that wants a 21% passing I mean, all my software guys that work for us want it over 97%. So <laughs> that that doesn't make any sense either. That's and, and I guess that's the other point is so a, a totally written test and and Scantron we can get scores back in June, but now a completely 100% electronic test. Which I don't know about y'all, but my word will, in every single website I go onto, will edit everything I do while I type it. So uh, clearly they can make pretty quick judgments on that. Uh, and soon they embedded that software in there too as well. Now thanks to August, well that makes a whole lot of sense too. So we're going to add three months to uh, to a scoring system that's now 100% electronic. So that's another zone of uncertainty for us. I mean, our, our, I don't even, I mean. Do we send really nasty letters to TEA on this stuff? I mean, what do we need to do? Yeah, I mean, well, it you know, starts with the governor, and the, uh, the governor hires the, or appoints the commissioner, so you can see the longest standing commissioner in the history of TEA is aligned with the governor, who we know is uh, about discrediting public education. I think that's the bigger picture here. This is obviously what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, there's too many uh, districts that have scored a, a or B, and they don't like that, so they're going to change the test and, and make it even more difficult and even more difficult to understand or explain. Yeah, they're in our kids and teachers that yeah. suffer. Yes. Uh, okay. I, I, I mean, I've been saying it to Danny. Private Yeah, it works. May it works, actually. 
Yeah. And probably spend another two hundred million dollars doing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you look at those numbers for reading, you don't even have to have a fifty to pass until you get to high school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, do we need to start? Do we need to post these on social media for and tag all the? But how? Idiots? And uh, honestly, how many? You know, we we go to the legislative updates. Yep. We, we we get this, and I, and I'm I'm just barely hanging yep. on to understanding. Do you think that if we posted no. that, that anybody in our community who looks at this would understand it? And and even more so, can you? You know, can you properly explain it to it one on one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you just say it's all about certainty. Any time they question you, you don't know the answer. Just say it's all about certainty. I mean, that, that I just blows my mind uh, when you told me about this the other day. It was just blows my mind that our Texas Education Association came up with the zone of uncertainty as a Published for guidance. 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 Yeah. Published guidance. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah. any other industry, any other yeah. organization you would be laughed out of the Yeah. I may try that at work to see what happens. <laughs> 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 see what happens. Yeah. How do you yeah, how are you gonna go over it now? Yeah. Well, well, no, no, don't worry about it. Having small tidbits like that in public would be able to understand that like short things that we could tweet out yeah. instead of like right. charts and things like that. Yeah. that do you understand that they're doing this and who else would allow that? Yeah. The, the, the frustrating thing too is you don't want to create too much of a issue publicly too with our students and parents because we do need them to <laughs> take it serious. Mm -hmm. with, they do take it. So it, it's a, we're in a no-win yeah. situation either. There's no frustrating all, you know. But if Joe, if, I mean, like his comment that he's hopeful that the students who took this this mock star are the high school kids, somewhat yeah. apathetic. I mean, if I was a high school kid and I even presented this zone of uncertainty, and I go to actually take the test. Any other comments? Audience? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, board committee reports? I'd like to point out and thank Rebecca uh, for standing with you with uh, Rebecca testifying for the, what House Ways and Means concerning House Bill 5 and Bill 13. They didn't seem to have much interest that uh, she was there. They had a long day of testimony. So. Well, not as long as the uh, House public yet. attended uh, what's called the Trustees United. I don't know where they came up with a name, but it worked out there. Well, there's about 70 trustees. Uh, you know, we made it around the Capitol and wore little red scarves so that we could be identified. Um, we did, uh, a couple of house people came in and, you know, addressed us, uh, Van Deeper and uh, Allison from San Antonio. They're, they're anti ralph Boyce uh, West probably gave the most, the senator from Dallas probably gave the most succinct, says, don't fool with the Senate. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a lost cause. Go make sure you focus on the House. So I thought that was, from, coming from a senator, I thought that was pretty interesting. But uh, uh, he said, don't, don't waste your time. In fact, he told my buddy from Dallas, he says, don't even come see me. <laughs> I don't need to see you. <laughs> so, uh, so that was, that was kind of interesting. I uh, did get some, you know, input from the DR, had some government relations guys, so um, I guess Allison was probably the most optimistic 
Scheduled meeting is May 15th. Uh, next item that we have is executive session. Uh, executive session may be called for the purposes permitted by the Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code, Section 551.071 through 551.146, Section 551.071, consultation with attorneys, Section 551.071 on any agenda item, Section 551.72. 072 for the purpose of discussing the purchase exchange, the lease or value of real property, section 551.074, personnel matters, appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, dismissal, or complaint, and section 551.082 for the purpose of considering discipline of a public school child or complaint or charge against personnel. We will read. <laughs> All right, we return. It is 8.38. Unless there are any objections, then we will stand in there.